recording. So here we have, we're working on a CNC torch table. Uh, this is uh, this is the CAD design of 21.0, not 21.08, uh, this is 19.10, this is what we built. The This long structure here with the torch was wobbly, we're redesigning. While we're at it, we're looking back at all the history of what we learned about universal axes and now moving forward, like you see here in this picture, we still have the two, two clamshell design where two axis pieces clamshell around the shafts and are connected with bolts, but now we're simplifying it just like we have with Universal and Pro on the 8 millimeter axis to, to monolithic pieces, which means that you avoid all those bolts to clamp things together, so you, you reduce part count and simplify the design altogether. So the problem statement here is, let's look at the three pieces, the, the motor piece, the carriage piece, and the idler piece, and you can take a look at the Universal Axis design or the one inch Universal Axis page uh, for all just more information about this. The approach is we go around building around common existing parts. That's the essence. So we're not just starting from uh, having to reinvent everything. Essentially, the parts that we use motors, belts, rods, pulleys, shaft sizes bolt sizes that all determines what you can do and the other part is we're also integrating with the rest of the osc system which means using the common parts that we use throughout so things like for example six millimeter bolts one inch shafts eight millimeter shafts uh, nema 17 and 23 stepper motors with a, a specific mounting pattern uh, things like that pretty much degenerate the design to this is the the simplest thing you can do so uh, in general, in the universal axis, all it is is a, is a system that gets you linear motion, right? So you think about the easiest way to do this, say like here, we've got a motor piece, a carriage piece, an idler piece, you've got a belt driving this. We're using belts, right now we're moving from the 8 millimeter belt to the 15 millimeter belt, which is a much wider belt. It, it, uh, it has a working strength of at least 50 pounds or let's say around 50 pounds. I mean, the braking strength is much bigger than that. So if you have a single axis, you can lift up 50 pounds. Now, 50 pounds is quite considerable. Imagine you have a dual axis system, then you have a 100 pound drive and you can uh, have even more, like you can perhaps double the drive because uh, the stepper motors actually have more power than that. Okay, but let's, let's look at the three universal axis pieces. What are their basic features so we can design them in the most efficient way possible. So here, I mean, what's the learnings from all the universal axis work so far? Well, we want it to be as simple as possible to, to de devise any kind of geometry. And we're just looking for simplifications and, and common parts, things that haven't worked, like what are the les lessons from uh, the former ones? So maybe to make, ah, uh, make some of the lessons explicit, like here, for example, well, let's not make lessons explicit. Let's actually do that by uh, listing design rules for how you want to approach designing the one inch universal axis. So let's, let's start with design rules or design guidelines, which are common to appropriate technology design in general or ease of build, design for manufacturing, design for build, design for disassembly, design for lifetime, uh, design for scalability, design for modularity. Put those all in and what do we get? And make, making these things explicit. So for example, like we're getting granular on certain things. All bolts accessible. Absolutely. Uh, no hidden, no hidden nuts that as in nut catchers this, I mean, nut catchers are cool, you know, that, that's where you have a, a metal nut inside a 3D printed piece and you can screw into it. Um, we learned that this is re re replaceable, in general replaceable, by threading into plastic. Okay? To thread into plastic, 
you have uh, to thread into plastic to connect two pieces. And we've seen this in a house with the, how we attach the walls. Make one hole oversize. Make second hole undersize. All right? You remember this pattern from how we used lag bolts to connect two wall modules together? We did one oversized hole in which the bolt could flow three through freely, the other one was underside so it could actually grab. So thread plastic to connect two pieces. So how do we implement this? Well, so maintain maximum geometry, uh, not geometry, symmetry. Maintain maximum symmetry. Uh, more, since prints take time to print, since 3D prints take a long time, Optimize for minimum printed material. Uh, you gotta you gotta allow the pieces to be connectable to one another. Like for example, here you've got in this example, this is like this custom thing with hidden nut catchers connecting this idler here to the underside of this axis piece. That's a custom design. It's not an original universal axis if you look at the original universal axis but okay doable problem what did we just say was a problem hidden nut catchers we had nut catchers in the bottom of this this carriage here where the problem happened where when we screwed in the quarter inch not quarter inch but we're using six millimeter typically uh, which is just about uh, six millimeters 6.25 millimeters is a quarter inch but the the nut catchers inside there because the pr prints were not printed specifically uh, precisely enough the nut catchers spun and you couldn't tighten it well how do you then take the bolt out it's kind of like we're gonna have to destroy this thing right now when we get to this because you can't unscrew it you probably got to break through the plastic because because the nut is spinning on the other side uh okay cool but we can do better uh, that's one way to connect it but it's not robust absolutely foolproof make it absolutely robust foolproof so in this case, based on the principles we just are outlining, instead of doing what we did here with the hidden nut catcher, just do bolts with oversized thread, oversized unthreaded holes on the bottom of the idler piece here, threading right into the plastic of this monolithic carriage piece. Thread right in. That means the, the holes inside this piece would be undersized so you can actually thread into it. So thread into part one part to another. Um, make make uh, allow for as much different interconnection geometry as possible what's that mean so make like example uh, allow x-axis to connect to y y to z x to z any combination also allow x to x y to y etc allow uh, like horizontal and vertical connection uh, you can go nuts in terms of like trying to outline all these rules but allow them to connect like here okay well here you've got the y-axis connecting vertically well this is yeah you can call it vertically to the to the carriage of the z-axis here uh, like from one side to the other um, well, uh, how about if we allow the y-axis, ah, if you, for example, if you take this, this carriage piece here, maybe we want holes on the underside there to connect to the y-axis so we can actually flip it 90 degrees and still be able to connect. But the idea is like, if you have a, a bunch of holes in these pieces, you can in principle connect one piece to the other. So bolt holes that thread in 
ideally that thread in according to the previous rules. Uh, so make a regular grid pattern. So for connection, use a uniform grid pattern of holes. Okay, so let's let's start with these guidelines. Um, I mean, we can go nuts in terms of outlining everything, but th this is like a lot of important stuff here. So let's let's do the new slide and let's let's actually no let's copy this duplicate slide. Let's actually talk about features of the motor motor piece. All right, what's the motor piece have to have? Attachment for motor. It has to have insertion of rods. Let's see, can you guys edit this? Maybe help me edit this, because you guys know some of the rules already. Yeah, you can edit this. Oh, how about share this? This is not, okay, so this is, um, can you guys find this? CNC torch table V21 conceptual design. this it lives well obviously at the CNC torch table v21.08 conceptual design right here so you can find this and edit it so if you go into this doc feel free to edit but so insertion of one inch rods belt belt throughway attachment to frame or other axes. What else we need there? Um, all right, that's that's main. That's a lot of the main features for a minimum viable product. You can then start talking about dimensions. Like, let's get specific about dimensions. So, you're designing this piece. Well, how how thick do, does this piece have to be? Well, it has to be thicker than a one inch rods. Otherwise, the one inch rods wouldn't piece wouldn't fit in there. So let's get explicit about dimensions <clears throat> and admissible parts. So what's going on? That, that's the way to think about it. Admissible parts. Well, let's do this. Admissible parts determine dimensions. So what admissible parts do we have? We have this. You can you can find out uh, NEMA twenty three stepper. Those are the larger ones. Uh, mounting pattern. Google that. You'll get a particular pattern for where those bolt holes are. That will determine exactly how you, where you have to put your holes in your in your three D printed piece. Mounting pattern square. It's actually two point three inches, I think, across. That's why it's called NEMA 23. Um, so if you Google NEMA 23 stepper bolt pattern, why is it called NEMA 23? Um, what's 57 millimeters? Ah, 2.2, it's close to 2.3. Um, so where is that 2.3? It's it's I guess it's about the dimension of the, the face plate. But that's the actual dimension. So you, you might want to say copy image and put that in here. This will determine your what you do in CAD. That's the bolt pattern. Okay, how about shaft? <clears throat> Eight millimeter shaft of stepper. Uh fifteen millimeter pulley. 50 millimeter belt. Uh, let's use, we've been using quarter inch or, well, you have to actually, oh, this is actually cool because quarter inch or six millimeter fits with thread and holes. So actually, now we made this universal. We made it both metric and inch. 
So this is a great improvement right here. This is that's big. So you got bolts lying around. You ran out of here in America. You ran out of your six millimeter printer parts. You got plenty of quarter millimeter, quarter inch stock from the hardware store, because the hardware store here is, may not have six millimeter in the U.S. So this is good. This makes it more universal. How do you know? So so look, let's look at 15 millimeter GT. It's called GT2 pulley. GT2 is the two millimeter belt size uh, belt spacing between the teeth, two millimeter. Uh, but let's go to Amazon because here we might find 15 millimeter. No, can't do it. Um, go to AliExpress. 15 millimeter belt. This is what we're using. This. Um, this has to be GT2. 15 millimeter GT2 belt. This. GT2. 15 15 for 15 millimeter um, this kind of stuff well no th this is six millimeter that doesn't that's not right let's see if I can sign in here uh, and then we can look at parts history here for uh, my orders so 15 okay well let's let's start with this this we got a bunch of these what's the shaft eight millimeter look at that eight millimeters the critical dimension that that means your pulleys there so let's t you know let's paste that in to the dock we got a bunch of these we got like 30 of these because we're going to make a few machines. 8 millimeter shaft. You can you can see that. Uh, so if it, let's look at product being 15 millimeter belt or 15 millimeter pulley. Well, GT2. Can't find it. Uh, let's see. GT2. Uh, go to the wiki if you can't find it. So GT2. GT2. Pulley. There you go. 15 millimeter wide. Bore 8 millimeter. Uh, so. What we're doing right now with the 3D printer is called 6 millimeter wide. Now we're going to 15 millimeter wide. And then the bore we want is for the stepper of 8 millimeter. Uh, what's convenient about, so let's, let's do this. Uh, so you got the NEMA 23 here. We've got this part here, so 15 millimeter pulley, eight millimeter shaft, like stepper. And you also notice what eight millimeter is. That's also the rods, same as rods, that's convenient, which we'll, we'll use to our advantage, same as rods of, of eight millimeter universal axis. You want part redundancy so that you have you miss a part, you can take it from somewhere else. That makes the design easy. It takes you away from downtime and easy substitutability that when you're actually trying to create a civilization starter kit, you can do it. You've got redundancy, uh, resilience, anti-fragility, in fact, because, um, yeah, 
Google that, that part. Anti-fragility is what we're aiming for. We're going more for resilience or robustness. Beyond robustness is resilience. Robust is that means you, you don't fail. Resilience is when you fail, you recover. Anti-fragility is when you fail, you get better. This allows you to do that within hardware systems, the part redundance, modularity scalability, all that um, minimum part count helps you do that quite a bit. Because then it makes you think <coughs> about, okay, you can also start generating the parts yourself once you get deeper into the construction set, you can start melting metal or like melting aluminum, doing zinc aluminum as a lower temperature melting point version of aluminum. You can then melt steel with induction furnaces and stuff like that. You can make rebar <laughs> and you can make large structures like we did the other day, um, column structures, etc. More parts. Uh, what else is relevant? Uh, I think that's, let's go with that. So with that, now you can start creating a part library in FreeCAD. So you go to the torch table, V2108, go to 3D CAD, start the part library. Oh, look at that. Ken's already started doing stuff. Great. Uh, edit this. Get rid of this other stuff. There. Cool. Now, in a part library, what we should have is we should borrow everything else that we do already. So for example, if we know we already have a, a torch table genealogy, right? Why don't we borrow parts from there and put it into here? Uh, because, so what, what am I talking about? CNC torch table genealogy. Well, let's look at 19.10. What do we have here? for CAD. Well, we all have a whole bunch of pieces. We've got, this is what we did last time. Uh, this is our, yeah. Now what are we going to do? We can take this stepper motor as, as a viable thing that we can plug into the current design. So where is that stepper motor? Right here. Okay, so we can go borrow, for example, this piece. So I, I'll go to edit and um, take this, take this part, and I can transfer it right back into here. And there's our motor. Okay, no sweat. Um, Let's go search for more parts that we could use. What about this? It looks like a one inch rod. We should use it. Um, I mean, it's super easy to generate in FreeCAD. Oh, but this, this bearing here, yeah, we'll use it. Um, haven't shown yet where we use it, but I know we use it. Um, oh yeah, this is the very important, the one inch bearing. That's, uh, and I'll show you more about that. This is like the critical thing, the, the bearing. bearing one inch, this one. Okay, this, this is critical. So Let's talk more about this bearing because this is a uh, McMaster part car part, McMaster car part, and we probably find it within BOM uh, somewhere before. Like, I'd like to find this somewhere. Well, I know where it lives. It lives at McMaster car, and McMaster car already has all the files. So, for example, one inch bronze bushing. That's what we're using. Um, this kind of thing. So maybe let's say it's a one and a quarter OD. Length is like one and a half. Steel bushing bronze 
Uh, not sure if that's the right one, but we've got the, let's assume the ones here are already correct because we've been using this already. So when we go to, this is apart from a master car, so you can find it there. It would be in a BOM of a f former torch table version, but now we can use this. So perhaps we can design, well, we don't use the bearing and we, st we said we're working on the motor piece. The motor piece does not have any bearings. Where are the bearings? They're in a carriage piece. So the motor piece will have the motor. It will have a plastic part. You have to attach the motor by its whole pattern. And uh, there you go from there. So if we were to do that super quickly in FreeCAD 16, um, Let's do that up real quick to capture all those files. I'm not going to draw this accurately because we can get this later. I want to just show the concept of what all we have. So let's let's start our piece. That's going to be this is our motor piece. I'm going to pad it out <coughs> to about two inches. There's a motor piece. There's then we're gonna have a bolt pattern for the stepper motor. Um, well, I'm gonna go back. Cancel here. Let's do this so it's kind of standing up like this. Okay. What are the, what are these dimensions? We're gonna make this. Okay. What's the max? Question for you. What's the max we can make this if we're doing this motor piece like this? What's the max here we can make this? Uh, comment that's a question for everybody what's the max we can make this this is the say this is the this thing here anyone care to comment because this is where you actually start the design. You're saying, oh, okay, now I'm actually making this real real uh, mount piece for the motor. What, what's the, what determines that? How about we make it 5.5? Why? Well, we can print on our print bed on that. So that's a one piece of information. Um, So we got our motor uh, mounting pattern. Well, we got to take out a piece of meat for, no, let's go, let's put a, the hole for the belt here. I'm going to rip, rip out the belt hole. I'm Yeah. That's the belt. Uh, I'm working in, in millimeters. In, is that a, will that be a problem with? No, it's probably preferable because, uh, I don't know, six, let's see, NEMA 23, like what, what are the most common things we use here? It's actually that, I don't know, you can do both, but like, for example, for the one in trot, you can say 25.4 millimeters. I think it's okay. Both are okay. So I'm going to put in one in trots here. Like I'm, I think I'm at, okay. work with both. You can switch between. So radius is going to be 0 0.5 so it's for example it's easier to make this hole um, right so I, I made that hole um, that's my one of my rod holes I'm going to make the other one and of course, I'd have to align this. I'm just doing a concept for now, just to show everything that's there. We got the rod holes. Uh, what else we need? We need to cut out for the motor, so you can uh, punch in. Well, get the motor shaft in there, so it's somewhere in the middle.
there that's you know match your motor how are you going to mount the motor with the NEMA 23 bolt pattern you can get from the, the CAD file, CAD thing in the working dock so I'll do I'll do my bolt pattern for the the motor uh, whatever it may be so you can mount the motor it's not accurate but there you go it's missing a little quality control here but what is what else we need um, well you can see some features like if you mount it that way you're gonna poke through the the holes of the rods so that wouldn't work unless you're threading oh cool unless you're threading the motor so if you look at the motor detail this is where you actually start start having to look at the technical reality of the pieces you've got so the motor typically what we have had was through holes where we go all the way through and have a nut on the other side but what do we say in our design rules we said thread into plastic therefore don't make these holes all the way through so modify this to be like maybe one inch well it still kind of goes into into the if you see what i mean here it still pokes in there but uh what about if we use like points 0 0.7 no it didn't work 0 0.7 or 0 0.75 i don't know we might be getting yeah it's almost they're almost not hitting but what that means is um Let's see, so where was my pocket for, this was my motor hole, so let's call this motor hole. This was my, um, so this thing we can move out, let's move this out. Well, we can't, we can't move this out too far because we have to have the bearings, uh, bearing holders on a carriage piece. So we can call that the second motor hole. This is probably first motor hole. Um, this one is the belt throughway. Uh, this is the body. Motor piece. Um, so there we go. Um, okay, if we take a look at, so what I would advise here, absolute simplicity, if the motor, motor mounting can happen, remember the one rule that says all bolts accessible, everything accessible, there's only one way to implement that. For example, if you have this mounted on a frame already and you still want to follow the rule called all bolts accessible, and that's the thing that because the engineer doesn't design, well, the engineer, uh, engineer may design a part, but an engineer typically doesn't build a part. So they'll be like, okay, let's just put these holes all the way through. Um, here we're paying attention to absolute dismountability, replaceability. So if you look at the motor detail, let's take a look at the motor detail. We've got it here, so we download that. And then, say merge it into this, well, I'm gonna just file merge it. Motor. Okay, so somewhere we threw in this. Okay, look at, this is you know not in place but oh actually cool it's almost in place but look at what's happening here you've got these um these recesses what's that tell you well that tells you if you have a small screw you can actually thread this right into the the plastic piece you don't need a bolt on the other side and i can tell you right now that this was very painful in the last version so what we did here to attach well let's uh, let's we have the last version so let's look at what we did in the last version and what we learned from it because we had the the bolt all the way through that means you had to have an exactly correct length of a bolt 
you have to have a little nut on the other side and if you say this is against the frame then this other side becomes inaccessible so it violates a lot of the design rules we already set out and that's why we're putting these design rules because we we're learning from the last time but let's open up the v19.10 and download the CAD and see why what was wrong with it. So here we can go, let's take a look at um, maybe just one axis, like, do we have one axis? Let's look at this whole, like maybe, yeah, let's take a look at the Z axis. Or, ah, let's even just take a look at um, look at here. So we're going to open up a new file here. Take a look at what happened here. How, how do we mount the motor the last time? And this is what we're building upon it to make this easier. And the ease is what's going to determine that the fact that all of us can just build one of these things in a day as opposed to spending two weeks and not getting a functional thing. So look at this. Okay, it's not shown, but the detail that would have to be shown is that you're putting a bolt here and you have, well, let's select this axis. So I can take out that axis, put it into a new document just to see some of the details we've got so there you go you got the axis well okay so we don't have the bolt detail so this is not uh, perspective uh, perspective view so this is doesn't have the detail but what happened there was we had to have a hole that's and then we had to have a nut catcher on the other side etc let's point being let's just thread it into the plastic and then we can use shorter bolts and be good. Now if you notice the motor piece, you know, you can borrow from this. You can you can take some of its features, like for example, it has the bolt holes with nut catchers, but we were eliminating nut catchers, so maybe just do bolt holes altogether. Note that this rod is kind of sticking out a little bit, that's okay. Um we want to add okay, so here the actual detail that's missing that if you look at the actual machine, you, you, um, you understand it, but this rod can slide in and out. Yes, we have the bolt bolts clamping on, on this, but in real life, it's slid out. You see it on a real machine. Let's put a nut cap, uh, a set screw in there. So when we pinch down the rods, we can do it. We can do it with a quarter inch bolt. So let's take that into our CAD design. Um, so I didn't, I didn't write that in a doc, but let's make that a required thing. Let's make it required. So here, another features of motor piece. Set screw to hold rods. That's important. It's especially important on the Z axis where you have to make sure that when, when you're driving the torch up and down, the axis actually doesn't collapse on you because the rods slide and the axis shrinks and the belt loosens up. So do that. How do you implement it? Okay, this is my um, sample motor piece. How do you implement it? So you got the rods here. Well, here's how you implement it, set screws. Uh, I want to look at the transparency of this. So I'm going to go transparency. So you see the holes in there, the through holes? Um, so I want to put a set screw on this. What I'll do is I'll do this. So put some put a thing like this, pat it out, maybe 0.5 inch, 
No, let's get rid of this stuff. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of this. Oh wait, did I? I'm still sharing. Okay, good. Um, sample motor piece is what we are looking at. So here we put this uh, pad reduced that to 0 0.5. You've seen this on a, actually on a 3D, the small 3D printer. It's actually the set screw that holds the rod for the bed. It's like this. So now I'm going to do this feature on a feature here. Uh, we want to design this for a, a six millimeter rod, a six millimeter bolt. So uh, what's the deal here? To make this six diameter, let's do like 2.6, let's do a radius of like 2.6 or 2.75. No, 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 like, see this is where, this is where I cancel. I'm gonna go to edit preferences and go to millimeters now because we're, uh, this is easier for me to think about a six millimeter bolt and what, how we need to undersize this so you can thread into this. So let's make this five millimeters, or a little more than five. 2.75 millimeter times two is 5.5 millimeters. And the inaccuracy of the 1.2 nozzle will make it such that you can probably thread into this. Uh, so this hole will be less than six millimeters. Now the thread size, yeah. So the claim here is that if we pocket that through, See, we pocketed that through. Appearance, make it transparent. See, this transparency thing happens on my other screen. But. So you got that set screw there. You can put a, an M M6 screw in there and then hold the rod. You see that? So we can do a feature like that, at least one on each side. Uh, the clamp force of all the threads, well, can, can our M6, M, M6 by 18 do it? This looks more than 18. Um, what is that distance that we need there? What kind of screw size will fit there? So we've got 12 millimeters, like in this particular example, we've got 12 millimeters plus 10 millimeters, so we've got 22 millimeters. Well, our M6 by 25 would, would uh, pinch down on there. So imagine you have 25 millimeters of thread catching into plastic. That's a lot of strength. That will be a very forceful set screw. Uh, you can use our bolt with a M5 hex drive, the, the M6 bolts we use. Um, so that's your uh, rod holder. So now you got to put in the correct holes for the motor piece where it should be. Uh, you got to make this such that the actual pulley fits in there. Now the shaft here. You know, the pulley would have to be mounted such that it has to be like right, right in the center of the hole and stuff like that. Uh, are we missing what? So now a question for the crowd. What other features are we missing based on what we talked about already here? So we got attachment for motor. We talked about it. One inch rods, belt through a set screw to hold rods. Yes. We didn't talk anything and do anything about attachment to frame. What do we do about that? Let's, let's use M6. Uh, is M6 sufficient to hold 100 pounds? Yeah. M6 is a quarter inch, so this is a back of the envelope calculations, quarter inch. Um, quarter inch is approximately 1 16th of a one square inch. And how much strength do you have on one square inch of steel? That's a real question for everybody. How many pounds does a one inch rod hold in compression, shear, tension? Pop quiz. It's determined by the PSI of the metal, right? In this case, for a quarter inch screw as a quick calculation, like you're designing this and you're like, okay, is a quarter inch screw going to hold or do we need like half inch bolts here? Like, okay, so we're building this thing. 
Can we mount this with quarter inch screws? Well, yeah, quarter inch is going to be 1 16th of 50,000 psi. Um, steel is about 50,000 psi, so 1 16th of 50,000 is like 3,000. So a quarter inch bolt before it shears, it's got like 3,000 max. So if you make it 10x safety factor, you've got 300 pounds. So you can so a three so a quarter inch screw can easily hold like 300 pounds, very easily. Not a problem. Let's use quarter inch screws. So let's let's do a bunch of uh, M5.5 holes through this. So say we got to attach this to the frame, like however we attach it. We could set up a regular grid pattern of, of um, M5.5 holes. Let's do that. So for example, uh, so that will allow you to attach to a frame or to another piece. Like say you got to mount uh, another one of these motor pieces at a right angle. Well, you could probably do it. Um, okay, so let's say what we mean here. Let's talk about the geometry of how you interconnect at right angles, horizontal or vertical. Well. What suffices is to have a bunch, a bunch of through holes here at a regular grid pattern. Let's call it one inch, uh, just for America here. Uh, so let's do a bunch of holes at one inch spacing for mounting. So here we got some space available. Like if we had to mount to a frame, uh, the rod is not in a way. So one way to do it would be make that. Um, 2.75 poke it through okay so say that that's a mounting hole for the frame let's do a pattern of it so you actually use linear pattern feature here that's called create linear pattern feature um, so you create so this is a mounting hole rename this to mounting hole create a pocket so here let's do a linear pattern feature so this will get you a bunch of these holes length would be that that's how this thing works um, maybe like 60 millimeters four holes uh, uh, four holes over you'd have to have actually you know 50 so that's two inches like 25.4 50.8 millimeters is two inches <clears throat> since we're there's four holes spaced by an inch uh, we can also do yeah I guess we would have to draw I guess this linear pattern gets you in one direction only. But that's the idea. Now if you have this, well we probably want to draw... So let's go back to this face here and we draw a bunch of more holes. So what we're <laughs> running up is with a sandwich of, of holes. Let's do the same thing there. So make that 2.75 now we actually want to make it exactly like one inch from from that hole. So you'd go, you'd define it to be 25.4 millimeter. That's our measuring stick here. Now I'm just doing a rough measurement here, but then it has to go there. That's that's a spacing of 25.4. So there's that hole and the other. Well, that didn't work there, right? Because that's not that's not one inch. So I, I would have to revisit that. Um, so maybe um, maybe like seventy, about seventy-five would be more like it. No, or maybe. What did that do? That's more like it. Um, but. Yeah, so that one, we can do a linear pattern off this, well, let's see, this pocket here. So what, what happens if I take this pocket and make it a linear feature? Yeah, I could go into vertical direction. 
and do like 6 over 175 something like that um, but it's about 150 so it'll be 25.4 times 6 yeah 6 would be 152.4 so that would be like one inch spacing here so you got this regular grid now what happens if you could take another piece so a piece like this you can now attach something at a right angle to it if you had if you had another piece like this you can attach it on its face you can attach it to this other face now the main thing we we worry about here is now of course that hole there is bad because it would go through the metal so that wouldn't work this hole wouldn't work either but this hole here and maybe the one above above that one would be good mounting bolts bolt holes um, so let's talk about so so if we have a six by six print bed we're getting constrained into into this maximum size we could do like for example if we wanted to minimize the print size here right and we still wanted a mount point uh say we wanted to have this be like as far you want the rods the one inch rods to be as far away as possible for maximum stability that's that's what that maximum stability would be so another way to think about these pieces here is what if we put like on this face we would go what if we do something like this a tab and then pat it out in a reverse direction what if we did a tab say we want to mount it to something and then poke a hole through that I mean yeah you could do that um, so say you wanted to mount this to a to an axis this way well you could do something like this uh, to mount it yeah I mean you can put tabs anywhere but the question is what makes sense uh, we should try to stick to these simple blocks so let's talk about the last thing which is um, last thing which is if we what do you have what do you get when you print or how do you want to use the the six by six inch print bed to the maximum effect possible right so in FreeCAD let's let's show that how do you do the most efficient way to print the largest feature if you've got um, say a 5.5 .5 by 5.5 .5 print bed so I'm going to go sw switch back to to my imperial decimal and then go 5.5 .5 and then 5.5 .5. so this is your print bed well if you print on a diagonal you can actually get more than five inches long so what exactly would that be because this is something if you limited by print bed size we got to optimize for it so let's take a look at it and and do a do a thing Say this is our our printed piece. We wanted this to be like say two inches, uh, right? Because the current axis pieces are what like two inches or so. So say we had to do two inches, would this fit any better? Um, so two inch, oh, it's hardly fitting anymore. So let's make that one two inch as well. Can we get any better fit? Um, so how long would this thing be? 5.6, now it gets you about the same distance as we could. Uh, but if you could trim those corners, you could get, you know, like a little bit more length here, so yeah. We're kind of limited by uh, a small print bed size uh, in terms of what the maximum thing is, but that's okay because that limits the size of things we can do. That means we can print faster. Like we don't get super excessive in terms of um, print size, so that mean means we keep to within reasonable print di print times. Um, but you can think about if, if you don't fit 
If you have a narrow thin piece, you can get, because the diagonal is a little longer, right? So how long is the diagonal? You can easily fit something that is 7.1 inch. So you get like an extra one and a half inches if you print something across, if you have a narrow feature. So that's just some considerations to think about if you're designing for printing. So I'll just put this into the working doc to show the, the basic geometry we have to work with in terms of print area. So print area. This is what we can do readily. Um, yeah, it's just a consideration to keep in mind. So we went through some of the basics of what, what we need, but that those are the requirements. If you go to the the carriage piece, you'll you'll think of other requirements. So let's let's without going through the actual CAD. Um, uh, so here we kind of like did some work on uh, this piece. Without going into such detail, let's let's talk about talk about features of carriage piece. So duplicate the slide features of carriage piece. Um, so bearings, insertion, four bearings, four one inch rods. You gotta have a belt through hole We gotta have attachments to other axes, but not to frame, because you typically don't. Well, you, you could have, you could mount the, if you wanted to, you could mount it to frame, but let's just say, but usually not to frame. What would be an application of a thing where you mount the carriage to the frame? Well, all you could think about it is the carriage is stationary and the two ends are moving for some applications like a pusher, like a, you're pushing like a poker that you automating some things, you're pushing, you're fixed on the frame but you're pushing the thing like a the axis is used as a pusher to push something over for example. Uh, anyway, uh, what else do we need? We need uh, anything else? What else does the universal axis have? Well, if you go in the dock, if we go to universal axis, belt attachment. That was the originals here. We had the belt pegs. Um, so we got to consider belt attachment. And cl we also have the closure, the bearings closure, because the bearings are inserted, and then we close off the bearings. So that's, that's how we're designing this right now. So belt, so not only belt through hole, but belt attachment means and then um, bearing closure carriage closure we call it carriage closure to keep bearings inside yeah those are the essential features the attachment to other axes uh, this must match the pattern on your other pieces so keep it at that one inch or whatever spacing we do. I mean, one inch is good. Try, try one inch. Keep spacing same as other axes. That's it. What about features of, of idler piece? Here we don't have, in the carriage piece, we don't have anything like set screws for, for the, the rods the rods are moving so you don't need that uh, you're not mounting a motor to it the main thing about the carriage is how do you attach various things to it so um, that's that now if you think about before we go into the idler piece if you think about the basic geometry of so say you've got you're looking head on to say the say this is my 
y-axis. So say this is my y-axis, I got two y say I got two y-axes in this configuration. Uh, the rods are going into the page here. So one configuration is the which is what we're talking about for the current torch table is that that would be like the idler attached or let's call it the motor piece attached on this side you got the carriage here and then you got the idler piece here next to this piece so the thing about attaching other parts this <clears throat> this attachment here it will be easiest if how do we attach this motor piece if we thread use the strategy of threading in uh metal into plastic so you do a bolt i mean how does that look exactly you got a bolt your uh, m6 bolt that goes in through the side uh, and then come out So you got your bolt that goes in and threads into the motor piece. That's, that'll be the easiest thing to do without nut catchers and any complications like that. So that's the thing. So so the, this hole here is oversized. So say we, we printed with our regular 5.5 millimeter holes, we have to take a drill and, and ream that hole out to be bigger than six so that this, this can pinch in and screw into the motor piece. So the, the motor piece in this case, like. We talked about some of the features here, but we're going to have to have a way, like say this is the motor piece, we would have to have holes on this side if we're attaching this to a uh, Y, say on this side, because it has to be at a right angle. So we, here we talked about holes on a big face, but we're also going to have holes on um, this face or the other face too. So that's a consideration we have to we have to make. Um, so here we need some kind of a one inch spacing. So maybe like, well, you want the space the the holes to be as far out as possible. In which case, actually, yeah, like this little tab here would, would be useful. But no, let's let's just leave enough space there, like right above there, um, where we can put it in a bolt there. So just like before, we we have to have a little space above this so that we can do a bolt hole in there. Um, so that's that's the, that's the complication. It's like, okay, you, you're making these pieces, but they actually have to attach to each other. That's a major, major consideration. That's like a very big constraint that you have to account for and make, make sure that that's addressed. Um, so we're attaching the motor piece at, at this right angle here. What did we do before? Well, for example, if you compare this to a device like the, say, the circuit mill here, what do we do there? Well, we had those nut catchers on the end of the, um, you can't really see this here, so let's not look at that. But here, what do we do here? We had the through, uh, th through holes. How do we attach that? Oh yeah, I think, I, let me see, I'm, I'm getting confused how we made that attachment. Well, here we used an external metal piece to make the attachment, so we cheated. Um, how do we attach? We had the, the nut catchers on the edges, so we attached that way. But here, what we want to have, if we ma match these up against each other vertically, then we're going to have to have holes on the end of one. And effectively, there would, yeah, there would be like, you see that space up there, for example. If you look up here, if you want to attach this face to another piece at a right angle, you'd have to have holes there. Like maybe one here, one there. So yes, yeah, so there's some, I, I guess the easiest thing thinking out loud here, like where you have the, the holes up there. Yeah, you'd have a corresponding hole right there. So the holes, these types of holes on a piece that's a 90 degrees from this piece would go into the hole that's on this face. 
I don't know if that makes any sense, but basically they, they need to be attachable to one another. So that's the design problem and we can start working on it. So put your, um, as far as the CAD part library, uh, Ken drew up the first one. So the CAD, like here's this, um, Ken's, Ken's attempt, is that gonna work? for us to attach at a right angle, I would take a look at this, uh, download it, idler2, so say Ken already did this piece, uh, we're going to open it up, alright, so you got this idler, we can fit in some bearing in there, uh, we can put a shaft for it, stuff like that uh, here yeah cool well we have no, no way right now to attach this at a right angle to another axis so that's uh, a thing we would have to do now we can also think so if that's a serious geometrical constraint because that means like if you want to attach in the most stable way you, you'd ideally have a bolt hole like up above this rod here you can have one here too and that would get you uh, like say you had a bolt hole there and there the separation there is about 2.5 inches but that's no way as stable if the bolt holes were up here so this thing wouldn't torque um, so the other way if we don't build in the attachment pieces into the ax the universal axis pieces there's another way to do it and that would be through external mounting points so for example if we need to attach this okay so say we've got I'm gonna draw this right in here so say we wanted to attach this to a piece that was like this there you go uh, at a right angle well you already know that Ken didn't have any features for how you go attach into this one so what do you do well, what if you put like a T-shaped piece here and screw into the top, like maybe even a, even a metal piece or a 3D printed plastic piece that would allow you to put like a bolt in here. Uh, so yeah, like put a hole here, hole there, maybe like a hole there. No, that won't work, but. so that you can put a binding piece like a t-shaped bonding piece to these two pieces that's another way to do it i mean because i i do say the the geometry here is you know you got to make attach the two pieces if you can't attach it within the pieces themselves because for example we're tight on space on a, on this side well on the this back side here yeah we might have to use a, a another means to attach it using connector pieces that's viable I mean you can easily 3d print connector pieces if we don't build them the means of attachment to, to the pieces right here now we've already done that we we cheated like that already here if you look at what we did here we already used this metal interconnecting piece to to tie this axis piece into this carriage here so we can think along those lines as well like like here if as an example if it didn't work for us to have those nut catchers that are invisible inside the carriage piece here we could put like a flat plate here and use this face and the end face here so that would work too like or even a piece where it's like it attaches just to this and then goes around this bottom and it's like a shelf that attaches this one and then you have some other bolts to effective yeah like an angle that uses this face here and the bottom face of this piece because we know we can always get many holes into the large flat face because there's a lot of space around there right so we have to just um, do interconnector pieces or build an attachment points right to this so that's a problem statement that could take us a few days to work out uh, we can do an initial cut of the most simple way to do it uh, we can let's see 
if we use what we already have let's I mean we always want to build upon prior work so we can take a look at if we've got 2108 and we've so um, here under industry standards that's prior work so we can actually refer to open source industry standards well the only open source industry standard for the universal axis that I know of is our work unfortunately uh, but I would link to the uh, CNC torch table V19 what was it 19.10 Well, so what do we do for the CAD here? Like, if we examine all the pieces that we have available, well, you see in this piece, you can look at how we made accommodations for attachment. And you can see like those hidden nut catchers that would go into, like for example, those three holes there. But as you see, like those three holes, that attachment was an issue. Like it's not f separated far enough to make it a robust attachment, like in this. So anyway, you can, we can study what we did before. Like we put holes in so that you can connect one piece to the other. You can study how that worked. Um, but there's limits to it. Like, like we typically use, like in this piece, these three holes at this particular spacing. Um, well, but that's probably like, these three holes are not as good as if you had a hole like way farther out because then you would get a, get a more stable attachment. Just. Uh, yeah, things like that. Um, let's see, what else do we learn here? Uh, we used, in this other torch table example, we did this before too, and we used metal plates and very small. This is actually the idler where we used a metal plate. Uh, that's doable too. Uh, so we use very thin bearing holders connected with metal plates. And you, once again, you have those typical three holes but as I mentioned, because the three holes are only so far, if this whole thing is six inches, they're like, not even, they're like two and a half inches or so apart. Not as stable as if you attach to the point here and to the point there. So uh, there's lim that's why we're saying, okay, let's try to make this better for this time. Maybe we just end up printing using either metal or using, well, metal is hard to work with. You, it's not as easy as 3D printing. So maybe we use plastic interconnect pieces. They would work. Plastic plus metal bolts. Plastic plus metal composites are very strong. So um, there we go. So there's a lot to think about here. But you can definitely look at the former work and see what was done. And go from there. So any questions? It's quite a bit to digest, but um, the thing was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is there a situation? Is there a situation where where um, you, your idler piece would you would connect it to another piece? Well, the, the idler. Idler. Well, uh, well, the idler yeah. piece, is, piece has to connect to the carriage of the. Like, okay, so. We've got the x-axis, let's say we use this geometry, we've got the x-axis. Well, we need to connect the either piece to the x-axis piece somehow. All right, okay. So, so why don't we do this? Um, here's one way I can show you. If you... Like you said, the um, like if you did an L-shaped piece, that was all solid. And then the, the, the piece that Ken made is all solid anyway, so you're screwing into something that's completely solid. Right. instead of uh so how about so let's do um yeah we can concept that up real quick right now so look at this so insert um slide duplicate the slide so let's talk about idler to carriage connection right so this is where is that that's the x-axis idler connecting to two y-axis to two y-axis carriages right that's what we have right here that's our current system we've got these call these the y-axis along the two y-axis 
Somehow you have to connect to the x-axis which carries the torch. The pieces you have to connect to are the idler piece of the, of the x-axis to the carriage. Let's take that problem. So idler to carriage connection. Okay, so let's look at, let's build it on cans. We, we already pretty much got a you know minimum viable product for say the carriage. So let's look at Ken's piece from the top. Say that's the say that's the idler. Not shown to scale, but we get the idea here. So the you know the, these are a little bigger. So say Ken's got no. this already. That's from the top. Idler on the X. Um, well, that's a that's actually a bad angle to look at. Let's look at this angle from no, wait. I want to look at it from the top. I want to look at it from the top. Uh, idler of the X. The shaft is here. So that's the shaft going into it, right? And that's going to be like your. That's going to be the motor piece. And then you got the carriage piece. Okay. So, how are we connecting this? Um, so, that's called carriage X. They're going to be the same carriages, so carriage Y. How do you do it? Well, we can put a put these. Um, let's, let's expand it for. Let's do an angle bracket. How about this? I could I could see an angle working like this here. So let's zoom it up. Three D print an angle. That will work and make it the whole whole uh, five point five inches tall. Let's just do that. Does that meet our requirements? Are all bolts accessible? Easy to do? We'd have to go one bolt into here, into through the idler and there. Yeah, why not? I think it could work. So um, let's see, let's take out a bolt from here. Would that work? So we put in a shrink you do like a bolt threaded into here because we got those holes right we already were planning on in our CAD we were planning on all these holes here like these vertical ones we could do those like we can do a bunch of vertical holes even yeah yeah something like that um, so would this work and then here we go bolts threading into like that and they don't even have to go all the way through they just need to thread in like at least half inch like I would like three quarter inch for a very solid connection would this work yeah I mean I could see this possibly working so yeah because I mean those whole connections uh, they get a little tricky because we don't have enough space I mean, this works. You can use four, four bolts on each, each angle. So you got eight parts plus two angles to connect it to. Yeah, something like that. So we have this is this is where we gotta think about design. Yeah. So we can think about. It. Uh, besides this. Well, let's see. Let's wrap this up here because we got to make it work out, and we can go back to the older versions of the parts we have. I mean, they work, but we can. I mean, if we want to, we can still do the underslung carriage like we did, which is not optimal, but it could work, right? So uh, we just got to figure it out. Any other thoughts on this? Like questions? I mean, this what I drew up right here. That's that's a workable solution. Right there.
Does anyone see issues with this solution? Um, couldn't we? Couldn't we just? You know, the the shafts on the idler are actually right at the end. Yeah. Uh, if we increase the 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 length of the idler, so you could put bolts in the end. Yeah. In the ends, yeah. couldn't that couldn't that work? Yeah. And then you just yeah. without having to use an angle. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And then you go into Cura slicing and you look at the print time. If it's acceptable, just go with it. Make it run overnight. But yeah, I was just thinking about, okay, absolute minimum. Okay, so uh, you t say, say that explicitly again. So you increase the idler size. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, so that you so that you could put vault in on the outside of the shaft. Okay, sure. Yeah, that's a workable solution, and it it um, yeah, it is. Now the sacrifice of that is you get less stability if you decrease the shaft spacing, but we can take that trade off for easy mounting. So for so you're saying, what are we doing here? So we're gonna get rid of this. And we're gonna do this. You have to look at it. Yeah. Right? And then we put, so the shaft would end here, right? Uh, yeah. No, I, w I was thinking, uh, actually the other, the other, uh, oh. What were you thinking? Tell me. Uh, I was thinking, you know, the the shafts on the idler are, are almost uh, right at the end, right at the edges of the idler. Yes. Yes. But if we increase, if we increase the width of the idler, uh, so that you have space for bolt holes uh, yeah. next to the shafts. Sure. Sure. Um, so you you're saying you're gonna have your. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, it's just a bigger piece, much bigger piece. You mm. mean this? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, okay. You can do it. Now it comes down to the production engineering. Is gonna how much time is it gonna take to print? All that. But that if you look at this from the top, that's a much bigger piece. Now, if it is a much bigger piece, then we can cut out as much meat as possible and make it lattice like so we still save mm -hmm. on the print time. Yeah. That's a solution right there. That's an easier solution because I don't like this thing. I don't like is 10 more pieces. This is two pieces compared to 10 pieces. Well, probably four pieces compared to 10 pieces. Well, it adds up because you got so many axes. So yeah, oh. we could do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. That's a solution right there. And then what happens to the carriage? Are we gonna have space? Yes, we will. The, the carriage would also have to have the space outside the shafts, so the carriage will have to be considered there too. Yeah. Okay. It's an idea. Um to to make the carriage explicit if we're looking at it um So say now we're looking at the carriage from, so this, this here was a top view. This was top view. Right? This was also top view here. Now it's front, like front view, like side view. So carriage, so say we got carriage like this. <clears throat> yeah, if, if your carriage is like this, then there's enough space for a bolt hole outside, yeah. You got this and you got enough space. So you got little bolt holes here. Yeah, I think we kind of have to do that. Does that make sense? 
so that in the carriage here, like that bolt is actually going into that hole there, both top and bottom for max stability. Does that make sense? So you have something like this with bolt holes here. So then you have on the on the idler you've got um, wider. It, I mean you can make the idler either taller or wider. So the thing we can do definitely is if you've got to keep it safe within printing distance, we've got 5.5 .5 inches there. You can make the shafts a little more narrow as long as you get your little bolt in there. So the mat, like, you probably need like maybe half inch space. Yeah, I, I think this could, this could do like 3.5 inches for the shafts. I mean, that's, that means the shafts can torque around, but if it's a long shaft attached to the Y axis, that's cool. If we've got the, stable yeah you see the point here so so the point here is that that distance between uh, here is like 3.5 no four what 4.5 because that's yeah make this half inch yeah this works this works right here uh the distance between the shafts is like up to 4.5 inches that's decent i mean what's the current distance we have right now um right so do this always have the space outside the shafts that addresses all our problems right ken yeah i think i think so i think so i think that's the solution right there that's simple enough okay let's see let's look at the i just want to check here open up the where was that um this one so what do we have right now for the current design and how does it compare the current meaning the last 1910 the last version we built so if you look at the shafts you know take a look at take a look at say um so you got this idler piece here right what's the distance to the outside of the the shafts. Oh. Wait a minute, is that what idler is that or motor piece? That's idler. Oh, that's right. idler. Okay. Four point seven five to the outside of the shafts. In the current design we got four point five. Hey, that's just about equal. Good enough. Do this. Let's do this. Um okay, but there's an issue of Ah, only issue I can see here is if you have yeah this could still work for the idler piece because check out uh, do you see the issue with the uh, the carriage piece so in the carriage piece you also have bearing bearings so the hole would have to be above that bearing but I think we can still fit it we can make it fit you see the issue Let's let's work that and let's yeah. let's rework the the size here. Now in fact, so if we got five point five, that means we're gonna optimize like we need extra if we had full six by six, we can do that. We can rework our universals. Huh. Yeah, actually that I thought about this making larger like basically getting the, the print bed because there's no harm in getting the print bed bigger. Like you can easily do eight or ten or twelve if you extend the, the y-axis, the, the bed axis, but you have to have a larger plate, which we don't have those. We only have the six by six inch plates. We can take, for example, two. Uh, <laughs> we can hack it by taking two six by six inch plates and connecting and welding them together, and creating a, a twelve by, 
uh, 12x6 print surface. But that's fine. Let's just optimize for 6 inches right now. So actually, or even keep it to 5.5. Let's see if we can do it with 5.5 because that's very safe. We can, if we optimize, get our print beds to be exactly 6x6. Six six. That means like we might have to shimmy the, you know, just move the, um, well, the, the, the bed size is exactly 6x6. Six six, so if we're printing to 6, we're printing right up against the edge, which is, you know, it's a little, a little challenging. So, so maybe, maybe we can say we reduce, the, we do this 5.75. Oh, well, I mean, well we could do it percent. if we if yeah. uh, because because the 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 area that the um, print sits on the bed is quite large. Yeah, we could do without without the brim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get the full six. Yeah, I think and then so. you get the full six. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so we want to assume six, no brim. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just saying that some people are gonna be fighting with that, but so I was saying like maybe 5.5 .5 is safer. But we can. No, can you just do it and everyone will will follow? Yeah, we'll do it. I I, I can get six out of my. We can tweak it. Um, but it's a thing we have to tweak. Right now we know we've got 5.5, .5, so we'd have to spend a little bit of time on it. So maybe. I don't know. Maybe for now, just keep it to 5.5. .5. If we find it's inadequate, get it to 6. Right. Okay, let's just do Let's keep it simple, because that means, like, people are then spending a bunch more time optimizing for that extra half inch, which means you have to have everything very tight. Hmm. Like, you can't, you, you got to be, like, aligned exactly. So that's, that's like, a little precision calibration work there. Um, let's just avoid it for now. I think this will be fine because if you do 4.5 here, you still have half inch space there. So as long as you've got, okay, let's do the last thing here and go to slide, duplicate slide. Let's look at the, let's go to the carriage detail to see exactly how much space we have to play with. So we're going to junk this one, too many parts, forget this, let's do this. So, so now this is going to be our carriage. Um, let's move the shafts over. That's our carriage, we have the bolt holes, actually let's expand this so we, we have the full detail of the... the bolt holes there okay um all right so what are exactly are the spaces we have to play with and is this good if this is our our bearing what's the od of the bearing it's 1.25 so the bearing is literally like this here um so we're gonna have two bearings like that and you gotta be able to slip them in through the carriage closure Okay, cool. So that little distance there, that distance, which um, let's do that a little more broken line, that distance there. What is it? It's going to be one eighth, zero point one two five. That's that means the OD of the bearing is one point two five. So that's one point oh one two five. So if we have the hole like right against it, that still fits. I mean, it could be right against it, you know. Um, if that's the case, and we've got this distance here is 0 0.5. Um, I 
that's 0 0.5. Right, so then what is that entire space there? We've got three eighths of an inch uh, for that remaining space here. So, will we fit? Will everything fit? So, that little space there. This point three seven five. And we need to consider a quarter inch. So point two five, that's that around there is also zero point one two five, one eighth of an inch. That's marginal, but that's that's doable. That is doable. Like we put it right up to the bearing and still have you know just a little bit of meat on the other side I mean you can't you can't do this that would be probably not good as long as you got some meat there above the hull you're good so we can do something like this you know should work and if not we can uh, either expand our bed act the optimize our bed axis the, sorry the beds bed size yeah this works there you go so we can cut it out all up and you can definitely have holes in the middle but the real stability is coming from you know you can have a hole in the middle there right so we've got these bearings here too you got your hole here yeah i mean it's tight it's it fits it works do it this should work because so now think about this we've got this is the x-axis but we have two x-axes right and one z so as long as we have two x-axes separated by the width of um, another carriage that means we've got very good stability on the x the, the y-axis because there are two mounted to the frame on other sides of the frame that's cool You've got two axes in between them, the two x axes, and you got one z in between the x axes. That should be a very stable system. It's symmetric, and even though the the spacing between the shafts is like the 4.5, this thing here, that's doable. That's workable. Um, for a non-compact machine like a CNC torch table, it's completely acceptable. If you had a lot of force acting on your tool head you get into issues where you start torquing the you know because the shafts are only separated by so far so you'd have to have more stability for torquing of the axes but I think mean, this is great okay do this this is our just conceptualize our design now we just draw it up that's it uh, there's a belt hole in between so we, we uh, between the shafts here, what is this distance? Because um, you need you need a belt in there, right? <clears throat> so you've got that space there is. If it's 4.5 minus 2.5, that's 2.5. So you have plenty of space. This is not drawn to scale, but uh, that's 2.5. That's plenty of space for your belt and your whatever you got. Um, we're not short of space in between that. The shafts so we'll go with it let's cut it up um, what else we want to cover so the the solution proposed by Ken is yeah just leave the space outside on a very far edge and that solves our all our issues and these three holes are good for vertical uh, alignment now if you have the same kind of thing here, then you can do horizontal alignment too, which is 
a bonus. You can do, like if, you, if you have this kind of pattern, this kind of bolt pattern, bolt hole pattern. And what I would do here, make all of these things 5.5 millimeters so when we need to, we can either use them for threading or drill them out a little bit to have the pinch effect happen. So drill them out to like six or seven millimeters so that one bolt, go, one bolt part goes on one, one piece, you're sending the bolt right through and then to se second piece, you're actually threading in. So make all these 5.5 uh, millimeter. Now, uh, there's a thing called rapid prototyping. We can test some of these things out, uh, draw, do a simple box or maybe like a strip like this. Um, see if the bearing fits in there, what's exactly the bearing, bearing size should be. So you can do like a small cut of this and just print it out to prototype. Okay, do the bearings fit? Are the bolts threading in properly? Things like that. That would be called, called uh, test driven design, partial prototyping using 3D printing. Um, so that's uh, 5.5 millimeter in the CAD. In the real print, it's probably going to end up being like five. Because of some inaccuracy, just, yeah, things like this. All right, this is great. We can go from here. Okay, so let's wrap this discussion up. Any more questions outside of crickets? Then the next... Uh, no questions. No questions. Then the next step for the open source Panopticon is to say, can we go out there for 30 minutes at 4 p.m. to clean up the wood pile? Everyone cool with that? Can you do a little... Yeah, I'll be some physical activity too. Yeah, a little physical activity yeah. to keep your, your yeah. mental sanity and uh, do that. Uh, so, on the 3D printers, uh, did you see my note in the email? So, ideal thing would be to c capture a build log and make it easy for you to do that. So, what I do is I always do the, take a bunch of pictures and they go up to Google Drive. That's one way to do it. Uh, but an effective way to do that so then you can share that in a working doc and ask all the questions for future generations to learn from um, and then understanding that we're on Universal 3 right now and we've been looking at documentation for 2 which means that we're not update we should not be updating the documentation for 2 we should be updating the new doc in version 3 so just keep it keep that in mind the best way I can help you is if you can take pictures Put them in slides. Ken's done this before when he was in Indonesia. He was just send send pictures and slides. Um, if you do that, I can give you meaningful feedback on your build. Like for example, if you were to take a picture of your controller right now, I can take a look at that, and in 30 seconds I can tell you if you have any bad wiring, things like that. I can verify things would be one way to do it or you can share this with other people but use me to to help you to to do this and do other details uh, the full manual so Holger is coming to summer X and he's one of the participants for the first month he's from Germany and he's gonna be he said he's gonna focus on documenting the 3d printer as we build it so he's built one one of the older versions in fact a v1 of Universal uh, in one of the steam camps uh, the steam camp that happened between Europe and the US uh, where there's a bunch of people in, in Belgium, but since he's built one, he's going to help document the next one, which is the th now at version three, which is self-printable, self-printable with another universal. 
So we'll definitely get it done. But I mean, in the meantime, the more we have, the more we can um, make the job easier. The the extruder instruction list, I think, pretty much complete. I don't think there's anything missing from it, unless somebody sees anything. Um, we've changed some of the minor changes on the axes. We don't have documentation on an actual print bed with the with the halogen heaters. Um, and the last thing I'll bring up is for the universal controller. Uh, if you think about what an extruder is like the fulfillment making, it does actually make sense to use the universal controller as the controller for the the filament maker because we already have speed control, stepper control, which could be the actual the motor on the extruder, and then you've got temperature control. So all the features for an extruder, it's, it's effectively a larger size version of the extruder we have the printer we have on the printer right now. So it does make a lot of sense for the universal controller as opposed to other dedicated electronics with temperature probes and like these dedicated relays or dedicated uh, temperature controllers. We already have all of that within a universal controller. So let's just use that. That's simple enough. Um, if you wanted to, you could even <laughs> have your 3D printer connected to both the extruder and the uh, 3D printer yeah. and by flipping a switch maybe you just got a switch or even the program like uh, uh, updated firmware that allows you to control either the 3D printer or the extruder so things like that we can integrate like if you want to use one controller to run both machines you can it would require just a little bit of different wiring as well as firmware but once again you can make this system more redundant by using the same part for multiple purposes so that that's one thing to think about uh, but in the meantime we should definitely do instead of the whole electronic system for the filament maker as you know an alignment or whatever use our universal controller to control the NEMA 23 stepper motors which we can use to drive the the extruder so easy solution there so we don't have to invent any or document any new electronics the the universal controller is relatively well documented already so that's just one thought yeah and then let's see for the shredder uh, let's see do we use the universal controller for the shredder uh, let's see so on a shredder uh, we're gonna do a, an industrial grade one that's run by hydraulics so no question about power uh, we don't want to run it with the stepper motor they're only like the big NEMA 23 stepper motors are only, um, they're like what, 20 volts operating at, at like a couple of amps. So they're only like max 50, 50 watts. Uh, for the hydraulics, you've got a hundred times more like from a regular hydraulic motor. So more like five kilowatts as opposed to 50 watts. Uh, five kilowatts very easily for one of the, even the smaller uh, hydraulic motors that are run off a power cube so that makes sense there because grinding is a that gets into an industrial process unless you're just doing desktop experiments if you're talking about printing materials for a house you need an industrial grade power which which would be like I mean you can do it on a smaller smaller very much geared down system but it would be very slow but if you have uh, say the five kilowatt level of shredder power you're talking about tons of material that you can shred overnight as opposed to maybe like a hundred or a couple of hundred pounds overnight so it's just a question of rates anyway uh, some thoughts okay so let's let's do this let's continue designing it where are people on the, the printers like I would suggest wherever you are maybe try the experiment of documenting and send a thing over to me and I can feedback on what exactly uh, if there's any mistakes uh, which would also be a record for like that should all be captured into here's the FAQ on build issues right because I mean if you run into the issue other people will be running too so we have to either design it out but you can never design out all the stuff that people are going to run into with their creativity so uh, it's good to have to collect all that into a document like the FAQ or like the build troubleshooting guide that would be the troubleshooting part which is in a build build manual should have a troubleshooting section 
and all of our inputs could be going into that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have any uh, conceptual design in the shredder? Sure. We got full CAD design too of the former versions, but we don't. <laughs> okay, so let's do. Um, I'm sharing. So what would that be? Oh, and there's open source shredder, of course. Well, it, oh, you might okay. not notice that this is what I've actually been doing. This is before using 3D printed belts and gear downs to produce a um, thing that looked like this. This is a partial prototype, um, but this is what this is the kind of stuff I've been working on. This is not what we want to do. This is when you have this was the last prototype here where we use this very small 100 watt DC motor with a mm -hmm. thousand fold gear down. So now you're getting rubber belts printed to this that where you now are running one inch shafts with 3D printed bearings. Very cool stuff. This is how you get this kind of a system with a hundred watt motor, which can still get you like um, enough filament material for like 20, I don't know, like 20 rolls. Um, so this belt here was like 1,200 kilogram ultimate strength. I mean, this is this is stuff. Okay, but this is not what we're gonna do. The stuff we're gonna do. So this is uh, let's call it, let's look at the precious plastic style shredder, and it, we're not building that either because that's uh, we're improving on it. Um, so here. So this is what what precious plastic has, and this is here in FreeCAD if you want to just download this whole thing. It's a bunch of blades, quarter inch blades. Uh, what we want to do is, um, their drive system is pretty expensive. It's like a thousand bucks for the gear down and motor, a uh, thousand or more. So we're going to have more power, like 10x the power at one tenth the cost in our system. So uh, this is what they have. What we're going to do is uh, basic. So what's a shredder? You've got this uh, high force drive unit. For us, it's just a simple hydraulic motor running off a power cube and you've got this shredder part so that's the CNC torch table cutting out a bunch of these blades that the look structural like strength same kind of structure like look, these are the blades that, that's what the blades actually look like this is what we're going to be cutting uh, blades that look similar to this profile and these are one and a half inch shafts that's what we're going to do uh, there's um, it's counter rotating so it's got two shafts which are driven by these gears. Like, we're gonna do several simplifications, like for example, use hex shaft instead of round shaft. Why? Round shaft is hard to couple because it will spin. So if you have a geometry like a hex shaft, you can yeah. do simple 3D printed couplers. So for example, the parts we can 3D print here the blades are going to be metal. The shafts are going to be metal. But what we can 3D print is these gears. So these are like f maybe four inches across. Um, but so they do. It does make sense. You can buy them. But for prototyping, like if you get a little cluster of printers printing a bunch of these uh, completely scalable rings that may be like half inch thick, 100% infill. Uh, you can print mm -hmm. this like maybe up to like four inches long. This will have to be a little bigger than here, which is like one and a half inches or so. Uh, just make it like maybe four inches in plastic, and that will have a lot of strength for you to to run on with hex shaft. So think about so quite chunky. Um, as far as the the metal box here, well, we can do that out of metal. We can also do it out of two by twelve, so that will have enough strength. We might do like a. A 2x12 would be sufficient to get the kind of grinding we need here, like uh, if we wanted to do it like really quickly, or we can weld up a chamber here. Uh, as far as what do we do about the bearings, well, I don't know, I, I might uh, be inclined to do, if we got that big hex shaft, it's not going to be easy to find 1.5 one, 1 inch hex bearings, so we might go to the open source shredder bearings. Mm -hmm like this stuff here this um this stuff right here that is amazing yeah that works 
we can do this. That's, that's steel, right? Steel balls and plastics. Those steel metal yeah. composites. Uh, okay. This is like, you know, so for a few dollars you get bearings that would be like 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Um, so that, that could do it. I, I mean, um, these balls here are, I think, three eighths of an inch, like eight millimeter or so. We've got we've got uh, half, like twelve millimeter balls. Um, but yeah, this this stuff works, so that's good. Um, I would do this with hex. So here I was doing hex shaft. Why? Well, it's easy to couple. Mm -hmm. You just slip it right through the. These are this here is the three D printed bearing there. Uh, so you see the hex shape works great. Yeah, perfect. So that is a hundred watts, but here you can't stop that with your hand. That's a tiny motor. Everything is three D printed with rubber belts, rubber three D printed TPU, thermoplastic urethane. So this is uh, this is the way you get about a thousand dollars of gear down for about fifty bucks or something. Unbelievable! Unbelievable, man! Unbelievable! <laughs> that, uh, the whole thing is still here, right? It's it's um, yeah, yeah. where the rest of the equipment is. Yeah, it is. It's you see it on the shelves. Uh, that's as far as I got. I didn't get down to the next stage. Um, didn't have time, but. Uh, it's a very cool like gear down project because basically you can have a very tiny motor and give it a thousand x or ten thousand x and you're as strong as one of the hydraulic motors on the tractor now it's going to be much smaller much slow slower but the force is the same so there's force and there's that's torque perfect. uh and that's power. perfect for uh, perfect for a shredder because you can do things like now solar shredders you just get one solar panel and in the daytime it just you just throw rocks in there throw your metal scraps and you, so you can be doing things like grinding metal or grinding rock in a bigger shredder like a little bigger than what we're building right now so blaze that would be more like uh, right now we're gonna build one with half inch thick steel uh, the rock shredder would be more like one or two inch thick blades. Once again, no problem on a torch table. And you throw rocks in there to make gravel for the roads and for lime concrete right now. Um, so that would be a cool operation where very slow mode, like 100 watts or 300 watts, even that, <laughs> you know, what, what I showed here with this thing, this that little motor, that could crush rocks if you have enough gear down. It would be very slow. It might crush. But actually, if you do the calculations, a motor like this still gets you, I think I went through that, it gets you still like 100 kilos of, of rock gravel per, even, I, I forget what the numbers were, but it was quite impressive, like even like up to like 1,000 kilos per 24 hours so it's like just runs super slow but that adds up over that long time that's the thing so if you think about it this way that this is a hundred watts well um, the industrial shredder that you make gravel at the gravel plant maybe like a hundred kilowatts so you're talking about a thousand times larger motor well mm -hmm. But think about how much that thing can grind quite a lot, like mountains of gravel a day, right? So here, well, divide uh, how many minutes in a day, you know, 60 times 24. It's about a thousand minutes in a day. So in one, so you can basically, this system here overnight can do one minute of like quarry level shredding, which is still impressive because those machines have like, huge output right they just like eat gravel up and many many tons yeah. overnight right so eat, like if you could think about it even this little motor doing one minute of industrial grade shredding yeah you could still do that you just have to have a gear down large enough so that's some of the concepts here uh, and it's all very cool because once you understand these concepts it's it's uh, a lot of uh, industrial productivity on a small scale so it's very cool. 
Uh, so the shredder idea is half-inch blades, a solid metal metal box, and we got to get the torch table in order to cut those blades because there's a whole bunch of them. If you look at this, this is the the shredder pro from Precious Plastic. Um, there's quite a bit of blades. If you look at the cab, there's a whole bunch of blades in there. Uh, so by hand, it's like not that's not practical to really cut them. You could want to spend a few days just cutting blades. Nothing but cutting blades eight hours a day. <laughs> On the torch table, you'll get that in like an hour or a couple hours, a few hours, a couple hours. So, yeah. Very good stuff. Hey. Okay, so this is where we're at. We're going to make the axes. We just, I mean, guys, we just figured out the axes. We're, we know how to do it. We just do those things. Uh, it's similar to what we did. Like when you compared what we discussed about Ken, what Ken brought up. If you look at these pic, this picture, just for reference. Yeah, this is what we're talking about. We're making the pieces where we've got these bolt holes on the outer, like just outside the axes. And that's fine. Uh, here, I think we used... Um, uh, I well. Let's go to the CAD. How big was this? Was this printed on a Pro or a Universal? I think that was a printed on a Pro. That's why we're going to shrink it down just very, very slightly. Um, if you go to the CAD, let's see what was that measurement for this piece here between that edge and this edge. 6.69 so this is like barely a little bit bigger than what the current universal can do but we can almost print this and yeah almost almost so we're gonna just shrink this down just ever so slightly now to make it fit yeah so can we use that uh, like that cat design and just shrink it uh, by it, yeah, right. Um, if you multiply it, the well, the thing that uh, not sure because you probably would have to. Well, that's actually a good yeah, question. change. It won't. It won't because then, like, you're changing. No, you have to change the individual features. Like, if you shrink down the bearings, they're not gonna <laughs> fit. Yeah. So you gotta pretty much redo it. Uh, you can go, what you can do is if, if, and this is a case for how we document here, if we properly documented everything, then this, well, the other part is that it's in two pieces, so it's the clamshell, which, well, you can just put those two together. If we documented properly, then we should have the original source files where all the sketch and, and version history is there, so you can go back to the point where it was say before the you know the bearings were put in and then you can mm -hmm. shrink it and then but keep the bearings you know just draw the bearings later yeah you could do that so you'd have to basically be able to trace the entire history of the of the um, whoever designed this but I can tell you right now that probably did not happen someone probably just drew it you'd, you'd have to basically in order for you to be able to do that and this is what I emphasize start a working doc for everything that you do and then just keep notes of the history of what you've done that's the only way that can somebody that somebody can actually go back to the work that you already did and actually modify it fully so that part is not hard because nobody likes to document at that level um, but ideally if we did that if you keep a whole document work doc here's my design here's my design rationales here's what i did in the cad um, that part doubles or triples the amount of time you spend designing, but if you're designing for the world's future, that effort is worth it because that means everyone in the future can benefit from what you learned and therefore build upon it. That's that's the general yeah, thing. Maybe like specific um, features, specific pieces like universal access. Yeah. I think that's a good one like to yeah. the time to to document yeah okay. yeah like any important okay. pieces yeah like when there's good insight like i like to document just about leave a complete paper trail because somebody who can actually follow it they can now 
nobody can pretty much I mean there's some people that will be but very few people can actually follow it but it's it's designed for other developers and that but a technical writer could now start doing something like take all that technical documentation and start converting it into human usable form Cur curriculum and instructionals and stuff like that so that's why the documentation is important okay. yeah but yeah that's the idea cool so we can yeah we can go from there and I think and to answer your question about well wouldn't it be just easier to just take this and modify it well there's enough detail in here that to work back through that file the answer is probably no it's probably easier to start it from scratch also because of the yeah it's probably easier from scratch because now we know like you know like for example the spacing between the rods changes like everything has to change in a particular way which we went over so it's not that easy to just modify something like that Okay. All right. Very cool. So let's uh, do some of this work. Uh, and if you need any help on the uh, 3D printer, start start a work doc to uh, document where you have trouble. Okay. And or just ask me, email me, ask anything. Does anyone need any specific help? Like, where Joshua, are you getting your stuff working? Or yeah, I've tested all my axes and they all work. The thing I'm working on now is the extruder. I didn't. I tried uh, the motor for it and it wasn't rotating this morning, so I'm checking the electrical and I'm adding the end stops right now. Mm -hmm. the, the, so the motor so, was um, working like the others weren't working? Yeah, like I, I went and tried to just move it um, in any particular direction and it didn't even um, click or anything. So uh, The thing that happens uh, there is you can't do it until you preheat it, so maybe that's the solution. Oh. Okay, so I, I'll try heating it, because the, the heat does work. I tested that for the, the heating block. Yeah. The halogen lights work as well, so um, I'll I'll try heating it, and then I'll try moving it after. You need to, yeah, you need to have heat before you can start moving the motor, the stepper on the, on the extruder. Okay. Unless you do, there's a, because it's called cold extrusion. You can't extrude cold, because then you're just pressing against yeah. something that won't move. So the right. the default is disabled. So um, is there enable cold extrusion within the, the LCD menu? I don't think so. You have to do that through a wired connection. There's a G code command for disabling uh, for, for making, making you allowing, allowing you to extrude, extrude at cold. cold. But, but yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'll just, I'll just use it as it's. That that makes yeah, sense. That it. Does that? I just yeah, didn't. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heat it up and then it should work. So do it from there. How about uh, Christian? Where are you at on the printer? Well, I'm just starting the wiring. Like I have to. Uh, I haven't even opened the slate yet. And, and do you know, know what I'm gonna? Which, which guy? Do wanna use? for sure? Yes. Yes, the uh, from, John. From John, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. Mm -hmm. Well, if I something, if I don't understand something, I'll I'll send you a picture or something. And I'll document it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That sounds, sounds good. good. So, are you coming to the hub lab? I'm gonna, gonna, gonna stay, stay here, here, but four four p.m. Let's, let's do the session. session. Uh, or, yeah. do you need, or do you need some help? Some more help? No, I'm good. Okay. Well, I don't know about like prints for anyone. Um, yeah. 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 Prince, do you need, do you need any help, or are you working, working on some other stuff? stuff? I'm gonna try and do the um the extruder. Okay. Get that all set up. Um. Okay. okay. The extruder is the main part. part. Like, um, the, the instructional there, there is pretty thorough, thorough so, so we can do that. that. Um, for, for the, the build, build that's coming up in September, where we build a bunch of these more, um, yeah, yeah, like if you talk about the hardest part, part or, yeah, yeah, if, if we, we can, can get, get the extruder, extruder, then people can, can pretty much get the rest of the printer, printer working. working. But, but anyway, cool. cool. Uh, Scream if you need any help. Start a work doc and stuff like that.
All right. All right. Okay. okay. So, so we'll, we'll see you there, there at four to, to just to do a little bit of um, outside work there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some painful work in the heat. All right. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Bye. Bye.